There is a question that I've been asked a whole lot of times recently. Will I be trading in my Zenvo TSRS to upgrade to the new Zenvo Aurora? Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to sunny Los Angeles, California, a whole long way from where we've dropped my new Mustang Dark Horse over at Ceramic Pro Chicago for PPF installation. We've flown over 2,000 miles away here to LA to the Peterson Museum where my Zenvo TSRS is down in the vault awaiting us. It's been on display for the last six weeks, but we're going to head inside, have a quick look around, go pull the car out, go for a drive and talk more about the future. As you can possibly tell from that, there's a pretty cool Porsche exhibit to go and take a look at, celebrating 75 years of Porsche, in fact. This is a Magenta 74 2.7 911, looks lovely, but we're also going to head inside because there's an exhibition of Hollywood and movie cars, display of Corvette race cars, we've got some Ferraris on display as well, and then my car that's down in the vault, it's been just inside in the lobby for the last month or two, while I've been off doing all sorts of other things, but with a weekend or so to spare, we've come out here to have a little look around, to go grab the car, but we've got to check out the Peterson Museum while we're here. So let's head on in. It is a little bit different here in the lobby to the last time I came to visit. We've got the 2.7 in the box. We've also got even modern Porsches, new 911 Sport Classic. The last time, I think there was an FXXK right about here, the supercar exhibit. My car's been at the other end, but let's head inside and go for a very quick tour around. You never know what's going to be on display when you come here to take a look. I think you get an idea of what it's about. In fact, five years ago, they did a big 70th anniversary celebration for Porsche. This time around, a little bit more about the people and the things behind behind all of the cars, hence the variety from race car to art car that you see. It would be impossible to show you everything because there is a lot to see here, but let me pick out a couple of things, especially here in the Hollywood gallery. A trio of cars from Transformers, two Bumblebees, and the 911 from Rise of the Beasts. Next, we have a Cobra from the 1976 movie, The Gumball Rally, the adaptation of the famous Cannonball Run, coast to coast. This was one of the two hero cars of the Cobra that was the winner in the movie, in fact, of the race. We've got the Lincoln Continental from The Matrix. We have a Batmobile, of course. Where else would you find something like that? Lightning McQueen is lurking up here. In fact, not the only car from Cars that's here at the Peterson. When it comes to Porsches, this is pretty wow. In fact, everything from a new Porsche 935 to a Brumos Porsche 935. In fact, I went to visit the Brumos collection, which was when I had just taken delivery of my Mustang Shelby GT500 almost three years ago now, went to visit them in Florida. So it's quite fun to see some of the Brumos cars that are here when we've just taken delivery of the new Mustang Dark Horse. But if you keep coming through, this is everything from Porsche Motorsport to Porsche Classics to limited, very rare one-off cars cars, everything that you can think of making up this display. And in fact, even if we squeeze around the corner over here, as I mentioned, we also have Sally Porsche. And then a 918, which is both part of the Porsche exhibit, but also could technically be part of the Hollywood gallery because this particular car was used in the filming of Glass Onion, one of the 918 cars. In fact, I think it's number 13 of all of them. It's got a carbon roof and carbon wing, but not a Visac pack car. Quite unusual also to have the orange piping inside with the lime green, acid green calipers. Did you know back in the 1960s, a four-door 911 was tried, a one-off, from 1967, that's a Panamera before the Panamera, except the engine is of course still in the back. How unusual. These are always fan favorites. The Mustang Eleanors, gone in 60 seconds, one of the original movie cars. And right next to it, in fact, is Scooby-Doo's Mystery Machine. The last time I was in this room, it was the hypercar exhibit. The Zenbo would have been right at home with some of the amazing cars that were here. And we will get down to it in just a second. It's now changed though. This is basically the crown jewels. Bugatti 57C convertible, that looks beautiful. But behind it, to show you this, something that really stands out because it is enormous. This is a Phantom One aerodynamic coupe called the Round Door Rolls because of quite literally having round doors but you stand next to it, it's massive. Corvettes in competition from the start all the way through. But did you know prior 
To the C5, they were always customer teams as opposed to a factory team taking part. When you get then though to the C7R, I would have seen this car running at Le Mans because I actually went to that race with Corvette. They were victorious. This one unfortunately didn't make the start due to some problems, but it will have been running in the qualifying and practice sessions before that. The Volt is always spectacular. Take a look at that pair, for example. 250 Tour de France, the original 1960s, and of course, the F12 TDF, the tribute in name and matching specifications. But come through here, the Ferrari display. Look at this. I mean, we have the modern cars, the LaFerrari Enzo F40, which is actually interesting to see a US spec F40 with the black front bumper that it has. 512 BB, 500 TRC, 400 Super America, 375 America, 125 S here at the end. And in fact, I have walked right past the Dino, which of course was presented in Rosso Dino, hence the color that I have on my 296. That one obviously being Giallo. The variety and just different cars that you see here is what really sets this experience apart. I mean, Pinafrina Batista, Jaguar XJ220 and EB110 behind. Almost delivery mileage for GT. I'm not quite sure what that shell of a 250 GTO in fact is. This is, this is bizarre, the low res car. Can you imagine driving that? It's actually a car that you can drive and just amazing cars as far as the eye can see. But we are getting there, I promise. We shall find my car very shortly. Who would have thought some of the cars we go by? A collection of Dan Gurney race cars, the Eagles. And then if we go beyond those, a collection of Teslas and the Model S that's lurking just in there, I want to draw attention to because that is actually production car number one. That chassis number one, Tesla Model S, which is now part of the Peterson Museum. That's a very significant car if you consider how Tesla really disrupted everything. Look at this, I mean, you, you get the point, you get the point. Let's go find the Zenvo. Okay, I've been distracted again. This is, this is really hard, really hard, because there's so much to see. I mean, we've got F1 cars aplenty without naming everything. I'm going to come over to the Williams because having an FW19, which is a few years newer than this car, albeit minor show car, and presumably this is one of the ones that originally raced, it is the Rothmans livery, which I always love to see because we tried so hard to replicate that onto my display car. And then, uh, yeah, everything else that's in here as well. And then look what we have waiting for us just down there, ready to be taken out this evening. And here we are, reunited with the Zenvo. And the craziest thing about this for me is right now, for the first time, I actually have two cars in the United States. One on a UK plate, one that's going to be on a US plate, of course, the Mustang, because that will be based here. This is going to be here for a few more weeks. It's a little bit surreal to fly so far away from home and the car be out here. We had so much fun at all of the different events we went to up at Car Week. And to know how many of you guys have been out to see this while it's been here at the Peterson Museum has been beyond epic as well. In fact, if I just come around to the other side, I want to show you something here. They very kindly allowed me to keep the display piece that was with the car up in the lobby. Just a little bit of information and detail about the car, collection of Tim Burton, Shmi 150. How awesome is it that this car has been here on display of all the places that it could be? I mean, absolutely mega. It's been looked after beautifully on the SeaTech smart charger to make sure it's plugged in correctly, keep the battery topped up. But I guess we need to try and more effectively squeeze the luggage in and then go take it out on the lift and up into the evening sunshine. I don't know. It's, it's just brain isn't quite there yet. Bit exhausted, very tired from all of the travel and now getting my head around the fact that this car is still here and it's ready to be enjoyed at a couple of very busy events over the next couple of weeks as well and figure out some really mad plan between this and the Mustang and hopping backwards and forwards, which is gonna unfold for you very shortly. I don't think I've ever previously tried to pack a lot of luggage into the front of the Zembo, this triangular shape that it has under the front clam. And I'm about to try and pop my other bag in there as well. But before we do very quickly, don't forget we also have the Zembo TSRS chassis number four heel tread socks in the matching spec to the Schmimobile. The link to those is down below as well. But I think I can fit enough luggage for a couple of days in here like so two bags nice and easy shut the front clam down 
like I say, I've never tried to squeeze in a couple of bags into the front of this. Mission success. More practical than I thought. Up we go in the lift, which is always quite fun to think that we've come up with the car and we'll pull it outside into the sunshine and go drive, which is bonkers to be completely honest. Totally, totally bonkers that we're here again with this car. But I'm not complaining. It's gonna be a whole lot of fun. So let's go do this. This is it then, here we go. <laughs> Big thanks to the team here at the Peterson, to Lincoln and everyone who has been effectively responsible for hosting this car staying here now in slightly cliched fashion i think we're going to head from here to the place i always seem to go when we arrive back in this part of the world we will go to rodeo drive beverly hills the iconic location that it is just enjoying the fact that we're back out here <laughs> that person has kindly allowed me to pull out in front because people see this car and they don't know what it is or anything about it and it stands out a billion miles away I just need to um, ease back into it and remember that I'm now driving something that I'm responsible for that carries a scary price tag and just breathe deeply, remember where we are, what we're doing, all the big holes in the ground that you have out here as well. The guy behind just spanned an immediate U-turn, but we got this, we got this. Zenvo in the sunshine. Tell you what, when it goes back home, it's not going to be driving in weather like this for a while. Well, actually, when it goes back home, it will never be driving in weather like this. But I want to obviously talk a little bit more about what the future is, what the future might be. Zenvo Aurora, goodness me, that's bright. What comes next? What would happen? What my plans are down the line with this thing? And we will need to go and put some more fuel in it. We do not have a whole lot of fuel left in the tank at the moment. To work out where we're going. Yeah, this feels right. Back all the way around the Peterson Museum, effectively on our right hand side here. This is the, uh, the whole museum. We've just gone in a bit of a big circle to get back to the main road thanks to a no left turn. Oh my gosh, I cannot see anything. I'm blinded by this low winter sun as a G63 comes past. Surprise, surprise. Welcome to California, the land of the G Wagons. Okay, where do we go now? Up here past the Peterson Museum and onwards towards our first checkpoint with the sun on it. That magenta 911 looks amazing. What a colour, similar to Ruby Stone, but it is called magenta and it is certainly quite bright and leery. I think I'm turning left here, maybe, maybe not. I don't actually have a clue where I'm going. We'll work it out as we go. Actually, I'm just going to go straight for a minute. A little bit lost, a little bit confused. I don't have a clue. I think it's gotta be this way. We'll find out soon enough if I've made a complete hash of this. Oh well, we're driving. We're getting this thing with some fluids flowing back through it given it hasn't been driven for a month and a half. It's always interesting to see what lurks in the showrooms around here. Can't quite see if there's anything crazy, crazy around. I think Ferrari's a little bit ahead of us, but I tell you what, driving back in the Zembo again, the thing that I can't really emphasize enough is that with a car like this, it's about the event, it's about the occasion, and you have to be so much in the mindset for driving it. Like if you just jump in here and you drive like you're driving a Mustang or a GT Black Series or whatever, your brain, your brain is off. You have to be thinking, you have to be engaging with it properly. That's what makes it really rewarding when you do drive it right. It's like my GT8. The GT8 is a pretty challenging car to drive. When you get it right, there's a sense of satisfaction that comes from it that's really hard to explain and being back in here again I probably should have taken a few more minutes given I've been a little tired and under the weather to really focus on what I'm doing before actually just getting behind the wheel I mean we're only half a mile or so from Rodeo Drive at the moment and it's absurd to be back at the wheel but just conscious of crazy drivers and all sorts of things that happen around you when you're in an area like this just makes me double 
think everything or overthink everything, which is, what's that coming towards us? Something low and wide in the traffic. Right there, 720 Spider, 720S Spider, first spot of Los Angeles, um, other than G-Wagons and Bentleys and the usual entourage of cars that you expect to find when you're cruising around these parts and never know what's around the next corner. What's a Ferrari? 812, F12 TDF. Nothing we haven't seen already today. Oh, up there, Lambo. Hurricane, Hurricane Evo rear wheel drive just went past, went across. There we go. Another Lambo, another Hurricane. Hurricanes everywhere. Welcome to Rodeo Drive. In the evening, late in the day, bright pink bunny rabbit. You never know what might be around and it makes people just drop their jaws. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> of course, how are you doing? What's up? I'm a big fan, dude. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure, have a great evening. <laughs> While I'm parking, I hear Lambos on the other side somewhere. But parking this thing is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying, to be completely honest. Carbon wheels, very expensive carbon bumper, and curbs. Another car that stands out, or I should say probably doesn't stand out much here in Beverly Hills, the Rolls-Royce Cullinan. Before the light goes down, it's pretty cool this car being here because when we arrived the first time, when we picked it up from LAX and driven over, it was late at night, absolutely exhausted. This time it's not been quite as long a flight over. I can hear another Lamborghini Huracan coming. I don't know, it's the same yellow one I think that's coming back past. It's a very distinct engine note on the Lamborghini Huracan, especially with the pops and crackles. <laughs> That's quite funny. Now, what I was gonna say though, Zenvo Aurora, and I won't bore you to death with all of the details. You've probably seen my first look at the car when I went to see it before it had been unveiled. And if you haven't seen anything, do check out the full video I shot with Christian Brandt, design director from Zenvo, to talk all about Aurora, to see the design of the TS series that had traveled through into the new car, to see a bit more of the specifics and understand what it's all about. And I suppose it's an obvious question that anybody was gonna ask me of, will I upgrade? from the TSRS to Aurora down the line. And there's no easy answer. And there's no easy answer because one, let's split it into two different things. One, would I like to? <laughs> would I like to upgrade to Aurora? Obviously, the Aurora is epic in every possible way. Everything about that car from the powertrain, the V12, the way that it's going to rev to a stupid RPM, but even the quad turbo hybrid setup I'm fascinated by, to the interior, the controls, the dashboard, the spinning screens. However, part two of this question is, is it realistic given it's one of these plus, what, another million, million and a half? And that's big, big, big money for a car and it's possibly too big money for me. I have to be realistic. I have to be realistic. So at this stage, would I like to? Yes. Do I think I can? I need to figure that one out because at the moment I have no idea. Obviously the guys are super welcoming. They've been super supportive with this car and they've been very supportive with the idea if we're to go ahead with it next. But at this stage, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a very clear answer. I don't know is the honest truth. I don't know. So I'd love to but I don't know if I can. Back in the car, but before we brave it all the way down to Orange County, we're heading, well at the moment, towards the skyscrapers here to go and check something. Something that I didn't manage to check before and we'll see if we're gonna get lucky with it or not. Otherwise, it's gonna be the evening rush hour traffic for a long journey because to people from the UK, you think of LA as one city, a bit like London, but the amount of time it takes to get from one side all the way to the other is shocking and by that i mean from like burbank or something north of the valley or oh, big bump all the way down to newport beach orange county down at the south side it's a long old drive there is a rolls royce cullinan oh and an older rolls royce as well and a mclaren 12c i think in the shadows but that's not what we're here to see respect to the person who managed to bring a boat on a trailer deep into an underground garage that's quite impressive McLaren. I see a police car, we're going around. <laughs> oh, Bugatti, Carrera GT. 
We're in the right place. As you do, a Bugatti Veyron hiding in a garage. And then one of my favorite cars, Porsche Carrera GT. And I have no idea what else is under the covers and stuff, but ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And there's an Artura as well, which is, I presume, a customer car. It's cool. Wow, that's a nice trio. GT3 RS 997.2. Oh, what a cool little trio right there. Rolls-Royce Cullinan, something lurking behind it. That <laughs> must be a Largo. There's a Mercy tucked in back there. And then straight opposite, well, there's a my back there, straight opposite though, is another Cullinan. I, car park spotting. And what's up ahead? Is that a... <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there's just a McLaren P1 chilling there. Wow. <laughs> I think we've reached the end of the car park, but I'm okay with that because the cars we've just seen, Carrera GT Veyron P1 on a small distraction, not to mention the other Porsches and Rolls Royces. And I mean, there's another Cullinan right there, like three Cullinans in the space of a few centimeters, whatever I was saying earlier about this being Rolls Royce land. Hey, there's a GT500 back there, I think. That's nice. Or forwards a moment. Yeah, GT500, non-carbon fiber track pack, and then a sea of Bentleys. What a ridiculous diversion. Right, let's turn around and figure our way out. Night has now fallen, but something really strange has happened, which is something that actually in this instance isn't a particularly big deal, but check out the speedometer here. It for some reason is locked at three miles per hour. Does that mean if I sped massively, and the dashboard was only saying three miles an hour, I couldn't get in any trouble because my car told me I was going three, even if I was going 200 and something. I don't know, hey, maybe, maybe that's like you get out of jail free card. So that's an odd peculiarity. I have no idea why that is or what that is. And I presume if I was to stop and just restart the car, that would probably sort itself out just as sensor is tripped or something like that. But interesting topic of discussion, particularly in connection with Aurora and Manufacturer numbers increasing. Obviously, there are going to be 100 Auroras, 50 Agils, the track version, and 50 Tours, the touring, more road focused version, both being road legal cars. But because of those numbers and because of more global support, you know, the car will be more available in the US, for example, registered in the US, which means there'll be more somebody you could call because evening here in California means middle of the night in Europe in the UK and of course in Denmark, which is a hard time to try and reach anybody and figure out what this is about. Um, not that I'm particularly concerned because, well, firstly, we've got a traffic jam anyway between here and where we're headed. And secondly, I don't think it's gonna change my life much because one, it's the US and two, we're not really going anywhere crazy anyways right now. We are just making our way, but something to be conscious of. I have no idea why, and I have also been very, very, very cheeky with my lane here. So I'm gonna have to sneak back in and say thank you to this person. Thank you very much, because that was really aggressive of me pushing in there, but I appreciate it, because we're lost, and I'm focused on why my <laughs> car is saying I'm going three miles an hour. And right now we are going about three miles an hour, so it's correct every time you accelerate and every time you brake for, for a period. I'm sure it's no big deal, but it's odd for now. It seems that I no longer have my excuse. Only a couple of minutes later, the speedometer is now reading again. I thought it was just gonna be a sensor that would need me to restart the car and it would be gone. We do still have the ESP light on, so probably if I did stop and restart it, it would all be back to normal. But actually, we are now flowing as well. Since that misbehaved until now, we've been sitting in a traffic jam. We're in the Hov lane, which I always find quite funny in a two-seater supercar, mega car, something like this, to be in the high occupancy vehicle, even though it's maximum two people. Anyway, this kind of thing is so much more normal than people probably realize. The number of times in my SF90, I've had to go into the passenger footwell, pull trim panels off, and pull out the battery 
to reset the software because something wasn't working for some reason. It's at least five to ten times. Same in the V12 Ferraris, the FF and the two Lussos, Christmas trees for dashboards, for GT once or twice, the McLarens. McLarens have had Christmas trees everywhere multiple times and you just get used to it in a McLaren and it's just a McLaren feature, should we say, that you need to restart the car and it sorts itself out and it goes away. When it comes to very limited number, bespoke, highly strong, high performing vehicles like the cars I've just mentioned, it's more normal than you would ever realize that stuff misbehaves. It's so much more normal than you'd ever realize. But this is now working as it should right at this moment, so I can't complain. Just go with it, cruise, make our way towards the hotel, and yeah, start to gear ourselves down for the evening. Not too far to go, and pulled up in a familiar location, in fact, where this car has been before, but I have to give it to Zenvo. I sent a message not expecting to hear anything at all until I wake up tomorrow morning and they've already got back to me. It's been about 30 minutes, but between the team, they've already come back with some thoughts. And as I kind of expected, off and on again, cleared the errors, sensors are all good, back to doing what it should be doing, no big deal. And you expect cars to misbehave, it's just something they do. Even my Porsches have often thrown occasional error messages and you just restart it and it goes away and it's all gravy. And I appreciate big time that they go the extra mile to make sure that with a car like this, you know what's up and you can ask those kind of questions. Even if it's just a question trying to understand how something works, they get back to you super fast, which is amazing. I appreciate that a lot. So a big thanks to the team over there for that. Something else I want to talk about and explain very quickly is the audio. And I apologize if in this video there are some strange noises, nothing to do with the car, but to do with the fact that when I'm recording videos, there are a couple of different things that can go wrong. There's a lav mic, there's a transmitter, there's a receiver, there's a camera, and there's editing. And that's multiple different stages at which you can have audio glitches. And I did just change and buy a new lav mic, the thing that clips onto my shirt. And I think it's not working 100% correctly because I watched a clip back and I heard some noises. America right there. That was the sound of a muscle car of some description making a whole lot of noise. So I apologize if there are some weird cracks and sounds and silly issues. I try and do the best I can do. And I've tried lots of different equipment, loads of different companies, and sometimes it just lets you down because when you're hopping in and out of silly cars, cables get snagged, putting harnesses on, race cars, those things are a disaster. Different just stuff in the pockets, keys going everywhere. I mean, when you have keys like the Zembo key, you put something like that in the same pocket as a microphone and they cause all sorts of trouble for one another. So those are the kind of things you have to watch out for. And sometimes when you're tired and it's been a long day and you're absolutely exhausted, it just goes a bit pear-shaped. Anyway, that is basically it for today. In terms of upgrading, if you said to me, could I part exchange the keys for this and have an Aurora? I'm not gonna be thinking twice about it, am I? That would obviously happen. For me, Agil over Tour, as I've said before, I think Agil looks amazing. I'm the guy who loves having a big wing on the back of the car. However, reality, reality is unfortunately the thing you have to consider. And while I am incredibly lucky to own and drive a car like this, and sometimes I still can't believe it, there's a big step as well from this to Aurora, a very big step. And even though the car is two or three years away, I don't know if that's something I could actually do without selling the entirety of the garage or half the cars in my collection. And that's a big deal. We'll see, we will see. I don't know right now. We will see. I'm excited for the future of Zenvo. They've got some very, very big things in the works. Aurora is clearly showing the demand already. There are lots and lots of customers for them, and it's going to be very exciting to go to rallies and things and be part of the whole team and community around it. I'm going to wrap that one up for there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. It's been a long day for us flying over from Chicago. We'll be back with the Dark Horse very soon, but before that, there's stuff to come with the Zembo and a few events out over on this side of the country. That's it for now. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you again to the Peterson for hosting the Zenvo, and I hope those of you who have been able to see it were pleased to be able to catch your eyes on this at the Peterson Museum. That's it for now, though. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon. Cheers.